So just to remind you about the planetary ocean, and this is not intended to be a lecture on oceanography per se, but just to remind you of the high points. It is the last physical frontier on Earth covering, as Bill said, 70% of the planetary surface. It is the largest and the most cl complex biome, or biosphere, if you like, on Earth. It is a huge and very mobile reservoir of both chemical and of both thermal and chemical energy. It is a flywheel for planetary climate. It is the ultimate repository of human waste, and in fact, erosion in general drops mountains over time into the ocean. About half the fossil fuel of carbon uh, that's been generated, the carbon that's been generated by fossil fuel conversion, has been absorbed by the oceans. It is a source of hazards, which you mentioned earlier. It is a vast repository of living and non-living resources. It touches all continents, most nations, and it is probably the locus of origin of life on this planet and maybe on other planets. And to reactivate a term that I first heard from my colleague Ed Miles, when we co-taught a course about 20 years ago, it is indeed, unlike the manganese nodules, it is indeed the common heritage of mankind, we mu or humankind. We must, we must learn how this system functions. And why? Because we absolutely must move toward a more intimate relationship between human beings and the ocean that sustains us. The first this, this five steps would be, first, awareness. We must change folks' awareness then the opportunity for all of you to participate in discoveries through this system that we're going to talk about, enhancing our understanding of how the ocean actually works, developing the capacity to predict and ultimately, ultimately, how to manage. We do manage Central Park. We do manage Green Lake. Eventually, we will have to learn to manage our planet if we are to survive without major, major Malthusian controls. The real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. Now, what we're talking about is taking Marcel Proust's advice of developing new eyes in the ocean, and we're going to use those eyes to see the interplay of Earth, ocean, and life through the lens of next generation technology. That is what we hope to do. And there are some key points to that. The first key point is that it is about interactivity. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is when you use these new technologies to detect something that's happening that you're interested in, you can then use another portion of the system with robotic response capability, and you can deploy robots to begin to explore what's happening there, or you can make new kinds of measurements, or you can look with different cameras. Interactivity is what it's about at a high level. The solution is power and bandwidth. Fiber optic cables allow us to put a huge amount of power and an almost unlimited bandwidth into the ocean. In the ocean, we've been using batteries and basically tape recorders when we first started working. At best, that's what we could do. Now, we can do something different. So we'll come back to this a little further on here. But I wanted to emphasize that. Now, the National Science Foundation has recognized the need for this activity. And what they've begun to do is launch a program called the Ocean Observing Initiative. And those that is made up of components that are shown here. On the left, the coastal environment. A very important component. It's where the gradients are steepest. It's where the movements are, are uh, most intense. And it's close to the continents where 50% of the population lives. So, we will look very carefully at the coastal environment, and we will do new kinds of science that are associated with coastal research and science. We will also develop a global system that will have remarkable structures that will be deployed in the ocean and have the capacity to work in high latitudes or faraway places where we cannot uh, economically lay cable. Uh, so this is a new way of doing science at the global scale. Both of those systems will be largely conducted using satellite links. Not all, but most. A regional component, which will be in where the little white box is on the upper left there, that's off of our coast, and I'll come back and talk more about that, but that will involve laying the fiber optic cable. And then a cyber component, which will involve linking all of these observing systems together and making them directly accessible through the internet to anyone on the planet with internet access who is interested. 
This is one of the transformational components of this program as well, that we do not intend to hold our data clutched to our bosoms. We intend to make it available, indeed ter interpret it at levels that can be uh, useful in classrooms, indeed living rooms, ultimately laboratories, and anywhere that there are interested folks. Finally, probably one of the most important and the one that is near and dear to my heart is this one, the educational component. And that component is a very, very important one. It's educational not just in that we will be a university and we will work it into our classes, which we will. We will involve our students in active research using data that's coming ashore directly, actually interacting, designing their own experiments. We will actually have some of those students translating some of that information so that it's accessible in middle school and high school. We will actually reach out to the public in general and try to change the awareness of the world about the oceans. That's our first step. We want to engage the public, the taxpaying public, and what it is we are doing with their funding. The Regional Cable Observatory, as I said, I will dwell on this lovingly, but the University of Washington is stepping forward and we're selected nationally as the group to implement this program off the coast of Washington and Oregon. And these are the components. It'll be a tectonic plate scale, that is the Juan de Fuca plate. The subduction of the Juan de Fuca plate actually produces the Cascades volcanoes. It'll be approximately 2,000 miles of fiber optic cable. We will develop submarine laboratories where we can actually do very complex operations using robotic manipulators. We will bring the internet to the sea floor. There'll be 100 kilowatts of power at least associated with some of these nodes on the sea floor, and we will have bandwidth in the range tens of gigabits per second. We will have real-time data control and return that will allow us to drive robots at will or let the robots go off on their own and then come back, plug in, and download data. We will have entirely new ways of operating remotely throughout the ocean volume. And eventually, it'll be a 30-year minimum lifetime design and probably will continue and expand. I've been to at least nine countries in the last three years. Every single one of them is interested in knowing as much as they can about what we're doing because they'd like to have something like this in their coastal or offshore waters. And it's going to grow. This isn't going to grow. In fact, this approach of networked, interactive sensors that are hardwired to the internet will become the environmental renaissance. It will change technologically. It will change the way we can observe our surroundings without having to be there all the time. And it will allow us to begin to develop entirely new ways of thinking about our planet. With that, I would begin to close with, with the words of T.S. Eliot, who in the four quartets, I think, captured the essential spirit of the human culture. Eliot said, we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Arrive through the unknown remembered gate where the last of earth left to discover is that which was the beginning. At the source of the longest river, the voice of a hidden waterfall, not known because not looked for, but heard, half heard, in the stillness beneath the waves of the sea. Thank you.